Well, let's stand together, please. Give you a chance to stretch your legs before we open the Bible together. Hymn number 255. Hymn number 255. Fairest Lord Jesus. Children, you are dismissed to go quietly to your Sunday school class with your Sunday school teacher. And if anyone needs a Bible, raise your hand if you need a Bible. Everyone have a Bible? We're turning to Psalm chapter 18 today. Psalm chapter 18. Beginning of verse 1, the Bible says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. Lord, we thank you for the reminder as our minds often wander as we often get distracted by the things of this world. Father, we thank you that your word is the plumb line that helps to bring us back, that helps us to understand who you are. Father, we thank you that Jesus told us, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so this morning we ask that you might feed us, Lord, from your word. Help us to come expecting to hear from you, Lord. We need you. We need your word. We need the sustenance that you bring. 
Maybe we need conviction. Maybe we need encouragement. Father, you know the need of each heart today, whether it be those that are here or those that are but watching by way of live stream. Father, do that which only you can do in the heart of each individual, drawing them to yourself and helping them in this day and hour in which we live. We thank you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the inscription here before the psalm, it says, A psalm of David, the servant of the Lord who spake unto the Lord the word of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And then went on, of course, into the psalm. And it gives us some insight. It gives us some background into the life of David and what was happening at this time. Of course, David, unlike the day in which we live, the time that he was taking or, to, or the way he was trying to hide from Saul and get away from Saul in those craggy rocks there in the En Gedi region. Any of you that have been there, you've seen the photos that we took when we were there. So many places you could hide, so many places you could run, but ultimately the battle was still difficult and it was very, very um, stressful and in, he was in peril of life, in peril of sword many times in those times trying to get away, of course, from Saul. Well, this song was written, this psalm, this song was written to glorify the Lord, to thank the Lord for delivering him, because even though David, of course, had ability, we think of the ability and the strength that he, that God gave him as he exercised the, the um, characteristics that God had taught him and others had taught him, be able to fight the lion, to fight the bear, to fight those wild animals when he was caring for the sheep, of course, as a shepherd. But then little, little did he know that one day he would be king and those, those traits that he learned even as a little boy would be used of God to help him. But you know, when he was at that place, even as a boy, it's wonderful because he had that childlike faith that the Bible says we all need in order to come to God. We don't come just because of knowing the facts about God, knowing what the Bible even says about God, but we must personally come to him in trust. And we see David doing that because in all those we've read in, in many other uh, places about these exploits and his testimony that God had helped him, that God had given him the strength. We think of it specifically in his battle with Goliath. You know, he was the one of all the soldiers who had all the equipment and all the training. He said, listen, I can, or God can do this through me, just with one small stone and one sling. Because he realized that the battle is the Lord's. That's not something that you read in a textbook. That's not something that somebody can, else can tell you. They can tell you of their experience, of course, but it's something that you must personally become aware of. And we see that in the heart of David. We see that that was a change. David was a man of like passions than any of us. Think about the things that he did. Think about the mistakes that he made. Great ups and downs in his life. Of course, we all remember his sin with Bathsheba, then him sending Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to the front lines to to have him murdered, to try and cover over his sin. And God used Nathan the prophet, of course, to, to come to David and to remind David of his need to repent. God already knew. David already knew, but the problem was David was trying to cover it up. And in order for his relationship to be right with God, he had to come in the open about it. He couldn't clean up his whole life. He couldn't change you know, the passions and the, and the evil heart and all these other things that he was struggling with. But by confessing and admitting God could come in like a flood and could do that for him which he was completely incapable of and then God said of David he is a man after my own heart isn't that amazing sometimes we don't think of God that way because we think of ourselves we think about how you know how frail we are how many mistakes we've made how far we fall short but the Bible says when we've trusted Christ as our Savior that we're imputed with the righteousness of Christ. That means that God sees Jesus. He sees his righteousness. He doesn't see our failures. Now, he still knows of them, of course. He's well aware of them. 
but he is continuing to mold and shape us and as we think of this progressive sanctification so that one day we will be like Christ. But of course, that will not come until we see him. Until then, we'll still fall short, but hopefully by God's grace, we are growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. And those mistakes that we made in the past, we're not continuing on in them. And so David is expressing in this, which was originally a song that was written to glorify the Lord, to honor him for his delivery from King Saul and from his enemies. This can also be found, the same account can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 22. And so this psalm was written when all David's enemies, they lay conquered at his feet. You know, he could have been, you know, as many soldiers do, boasting in what they do. But David realized that this absolute victory had been given was not through the arm of flesh. The Bible says the arm of flesh will fail you, you know. And so David had to remember in those times, in those battles with Saul, he had to remember what God taught him as a shepherd boy and how his heart had been softened by the God of heaven and how he had in simple childlike faith trusted God to help him with things. You know, sometimes things get complicated as we get older. You know, you think of the Jew as we went through the Gospel of Mark, as we went through the Gospel of John several years ago. It's always amazing to me, and you hear me repeat it so many times, because those in Jesus' day who had the most knowledge of the Bible were the furthest from him. And that is still true today many times. You can have all the right theology, you can have the right theologians, you can, but yet sometimes those people are still the farthest from God. Because our relationship with God begins in our heart. Abraham, as we saw him recently, believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's where it all starts, believing God. And of course, then we grow as believers. But David had been given absolute victory, and he wanted to express his gratitude to the Lord, of course, for his great provision. He recognized, he realized where it had come from. During the time that David was running from Saul, he was in constant danger of death. Now he's been delivered. He lifts up his voice in praise to the Lord God who has given him the victory. This is David's song of victory right here. But you know, you and I have a song of victory to sing as well. Maybe we don't recognize it. There could be several reasons for that. But when God saved us, he gave us victory over our enemies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This can't be a victory that comes just through intellectual understanding or through position, through birthright, through religion. It has to come from a heart that has connected with God in simple childlike faith, just as David's did. David may have got older, he might have got stronger, he, he got wiser, he, got, he was moved to great positions of authority. But ultimately, he had a downfall. He had a downfall. And sometimes those downfalls are what God uses even to remind us of where we need to go back to or where we need to start, right? Remember the Apostle Paul with the thorn in his flesh? He... He prayed thrice, three times, and God would take it from him, and God said, no, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You see, when David was a little a shepherd boy, he was very weak. He didn't know what to do, how to do it. He was completely dependent on God. All he had was a little stone and a sling. And ultimately, that's what God allowed to, you know, what God used to allow him to bring down the giant. It's not, you know, what we have, whether it be knowledge or whether it be might or whether it be anything else, those things are actually often, they often stand in the way. They can be hindrances to our relationship with God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so for the Christian, this is, not just something to be hoped for in the future. When we think of this verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 
but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes as Christians, we can think, well, yeah, that's true. That's going to happen in the future. One day when I see Jesus, one day if I make it, if everything is good. But no, for the Christian, this is not something to be hoped for in the future, but it's ours right now. Because the Bible tells us who we are in Christ. And unless we know who we are in Christ, we're never going to be growing as believers. Because doubt is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. They that come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Where are you going to find out who God is? It's not through the Talmud. It's not through the extra curricular writings of the, or the traditions that the Jews had. They had all that. They had the Bible, but they had many other things as well. And Jesus said, on the outside you're as whitewashed tombs, but inside you're full of dead men's bones because they didn't know him and the power that he could bring to their individual lives. And sadly ended up, for many of them, pride got in the way. And I'm, of course, many Jews ended up establishing the early church. That, that, was, that was it. Thank God they came to faith. They recognized who their Messiah was. But we must know who we are in Christ. Romans 8, 37, the second part of that verse says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so we who were in danger of hell in danger of being separated from God for all eternity. That's all we deserved. Because we were rebellious against the God who created us. We loved our sin more than we loved God. All we like sheep have gone astray. All we have gone our own way. But thank God, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He took it upon himself. And so since we have been saved and delivered from the snare of the enemy, we also have many reasons, of course, to worship and to praise the Lord today. God inhabits the praise of his people, the Bible says. So we need to thank him and then walk in that knowledge of all that it is that he's done. The word worship, we talked about this a number of weeks ago, the word worship comes from the old English word that means worth-ship, worth-ship. And so it means to ascribe worth to someone. We worship God because he is worthy. He alone is worthy. And so our worship ascribes worth to him because of who he is and because of what he does. Now he still expects some things of us. He's created us with the opportunity and the ability to be able to recognize who he is, to be able to acknowledge who he is, to be able to draw nigh to him. Because he's already initiated the love relationship. He's done it all. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, the first point we want to think about briefly today is that God is worthy of our delight. We see this in verse 1 of Psalm 18. I will love thee, O Lord my strength. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. At the very beginning, the psalmist makes two great declarations. He bears his heart, and he tells us what he has determined to do because of what God has done. So first, he declares his love for the Lord. Secondly, he declares his absolute dependence upon the Lord. And so he seems to be indicating that he will live his life with these two great themes ever before him. And that he finds his greatest delight in the Lord. Now you may have heard me say it before, but love without truth is treason to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of Christians say talk about love. You know, it's all about love and it's all about forgetting our differences and it's about loving everybody. But we can only love in accordance with, you know, there's some things that God hates. The Bible tells us and describes those things. God loves all men. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there's many things that men do that God hates. There's many things that people hold to that God hates. And so there must be a change that takes place. In order for us to love God, obviously we must come to the end of ourselves. We must recognize who he is 
We must trust him personally. Otherwise, there's no possibility of us loving him. Secondly, David declares his absolute dependence upon the Lord. And so this is a secret to the Christian life. Love and dependence. Love and dependence. Setting our heart towards him each day. You know what? Our heart is prone to wander. If we don't set our heart towards God, we're going to set our heart on something else or on someone else. Now, there's, nothing, there's people in our life that we love, but nobody in our life that we love should come before God. God must be first always, or every other relationship will not be in its proper order, in its proper place. Setting our heart towards him each day. He's already, of course, you know, remember, even after Adam sinned in the garden, what did, you know, Adam's trying to hide, you know, thinking that he can hide from God, and God's like, Adam! Adam, where are you? He knew where Adam was, but he's just like letting Adam know, why are you hiding from me? I can see, I know what you've done wrong. So, you know, we can't hide from God. God just wants us to come to him. Acknowledge our sin. Say, God, help me. Work this change in my heart. I, I don't want to do these things. You know? I remember many times as a new believer saying, God, I don't want to do this. Help me to do it. Give me a heart to do this. Give me a heart to reach others. Give me a heart to speak to others about you. Give me a heart to... To, you know, to be a good worker and to be able to share my testimony at work, whatever the case might be. I didn't want to do, none of us many times want to do the things. There's always a rare person that does want to, and that's a blessing. But it starts, it's probably because their, their heart has been cultivated and they've been, they've been allowing God to work in their heart. So we need to set our heart towards them each day. There are many things that we do in life, but to do them apart from God is vain and futile. God gives us many things freely to enjoy. We have so many blessings in our life here in the, in, you know, in the 21st century in, in our Western world. But many times they can be distractions. They can actually draw, draw us away from God and then, and then life becomes vain and futile. A man's life, the Bible says, do not, does not consist in the abundance of things which he possesses. Right? And so let's... Let's look at these two themes a little more closely and see what they mean for us today in, in this busy, busy life that we now live in, this world in which we live in. Some things never change. And as David said, I will love the Lord. I will love the Lord. You see, it's an act of our will. It's an act, it's, it's, a, it's a response toward God, of what he has already done for us. I will love the Lord. When you go into the beauty of creation, you say, I will love the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this. I will love you, Lord. Sometimes we don't, our heart doesn't feel tender towards God because of maybe the circumstances of life. But we have to make a conscious decision to say, I will love the Lord. Lord, help me. The word translated love here is a word that means to love deeply. It's not the standard word translated, translated love. The standard word speaks of covenant love. We're going to be talking about that a little bit more in the coming weeks. Covenant love. Covenant love is important, and it's a starting point for our love, but the word here speaks of tender intimacy. And so one should lead to the other, of course. It should lead, covenant love should lead to this tender intimacy. But it carries the idea of a mother's love for her child, that close type of love, that intimate love. It has the idea of loving one so much you just want to be near to them, you just want to be close to them because a special bond has been developed. And so the psalmist is telling us that he is so filled with love for the Lord that he just wants to be close with the Lord forever. There's, there's to be apart from the Lord because of his own sin or because of the enemy or whatever the case might be is now the worst thing for him. And so it speaks of a close love and it speaks of a close dependence. Sometimes we don't realize how much we need that until, it has, until we don't have it for a period of time for whatever reason. And so this is the emotion felt by Mary Magdalene when she encountered the risen Christ, remember, in John chapter 20. And by the disciples when they saw Jesus after... Uh, his resurrection, Matthew 28, verse 9, they came and they held him by the feet and they worshipped him, the Bible says. And so when we think about all that the Lord has done for us and how he loves us and how he's made a way for us to be saved, 
our heart should also be filled with that same kind of love for him, of course. 1 John 4.19, as I alluded to earlier already, we love him because he first loved us. And so the other one we want to think about is I will lean on the Lord. I will lean on the Lord. Not only will I love the Lord, you notice that, that, that these are words of conscious decision and these are irrelevant or irregardless of what the emotion might be. Sometimes we don't have the emotion. The emotion might come later or it might not. But these are conscious decisions based upon who God is. I will love the Lord. I will lean on the Lord. And so he calls God my strength. He realizes, he understands where his strength comes from. Nine times in the first two verses, David uses the word my. You know, when you think of it, my is the first word that most children learn, isn't it? My toy. My snack. You know, my ball. It's, it's one of the very first words they learn, isn't it? It's just their childish way of stating what they know and what they believe to be theirs, right? And so what David is doing is expressing even here simple childlike faith in his relationship with the Lord, so important. He doesn't hope that God loves him. He doesn't hope that he's saved. No, no. He's telling us that he's totally dependent upon the Lord for everything. His strength comes from the Lord. His strength came from the Lord. And so the fact of the matter is that we can do nothing, of course, without him. John, uh, Jesus spoke of this, and we have it recorded in John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus said, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. And so it's also true that, you know, we can't do anything without him, but the fact of the matter is that we can do everything with him. That's the amazing truth. We can do everything with him. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Some of those things I I mentioned to you earlier that I was praying and saying, Lord, help me with this. I had to have my mind renewed to his word and say, I can do this. I feel, you know, myself, my own emotions, my own being, I've never done this before, I don't want to do this, but the Bible says I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And so we have to have our mind renewed to those biblical truths. David's plan is to live for the Lord, to love the Lord, to learn to lean on the Lord for everything he needs and everything that he does in, his, in life. But it wasn't just infused within him where he had a natural bent and um, now desire to serve God all the time. We see that in regards to what happened with Bathsheba and other mistakes that he made. But it was understanding that, yeah, my natural desire and inkling may be the wrong way, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purpose in my heart to serve the Lord. I'm going to purpose in my heart to love him and to, because that's where it starts, to love him and then to lean on him and then to trust that he will do through me and work through me. And so this is a great goal for every believer. We see, first of all, that God is worthy of our delight. Secondly, we see God is worthy of our dependence. Verse 2, God is worthy of our dependence. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my strength, and whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. And so David allows us to see a heart of worship engaged in the praise and object of its love, God himself. And this is in where the rubber meets the road, in, the, in, the, you know, in how he's conducting his life. That's his worship. And so there's praise for a personal God. We see the usage of my again. The most important thing in life is knowing, of course, that you are right with God. That's, there's, nothing that, there's nothing that can you know, trump that there's nothing that is better than that nothing that is more needed than that is that knowing that you are right with god so many times i ask people you know whether it be on the street or other places hey if you were to die today could you be sure you'd go to heaven i hope so i really hope so and some people think it's presumptuous to say well i know so well the apostle paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the lord he wasn't some spiritual superstar there's no superstars in the bible He was just a man that was saved by grace. He was able to get out of the way. The reason why Paul was so great is because 
he was smitten on the road to Damascus and he continued by his own will to say, I'm going to remain there. I'm going to remain dead. It's no longer I who live. It's no longer I who live. It's no longer I who live. You think that just came automatically to him? No, he had a purpose in his heart. He had, a, he had to acknowledge his life in, in, um, in relation to the word of God in regards to what God had told him. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I live by what? I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You're never going to know who you are. You're never, never going to know where you're going unless you know the word of God. Because the word of God, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's God's word that brings, that brings knowledge. It's God's word that brings peace. It's God's word that brings the stability and helps us to understand who we are. It cuts through all of the, the things that we may have been taught and that others may have told us. But it's not God's word alone. It's God's word by his spirit. We cannot understand the word of God except we know Christ personally. So we must come in that childlike faith just as David did. This is the problem that the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day they had. They had all of the word of God, but they did not have the spirit of God. Jesus said, you're of your father the devil, and the works of your father you'll do. And so they needed they needed to understand and recognize and fall at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and have a heart change just as David did. And so David allows us to see a heart of worship engaged in the praise and of the object of his love, God himself. There's praise for a personal God. We see the usage of my, again, the most important thing, again, is knowing. There must have been a time, there has to be a time when we have personally turned to the Lord Jesus Christ as an act of our own will, in absolute faith in him for salvation. God has done everything he's going to do, but he wants us to step out by faith. He commands Jesus, the greatest command of Jesus is that he commands all men everywhere to repent. He says, repent and believe the gospel. And so nothing else will work for anyone ever, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved, of course, through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, but that gift must be received. We must receive that gift of eternal life that Jesus Christ offers to us. And then Acts 16, 31 again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul said, and thou shalt be saved. And so they had heard of him, they knew of him. They knew the one that they were looking for, that they were waiting for, the Messiah. But then when he came into their presence, they did not believe on him because sometimes that's the most difficult thing. Because it means that there's maybe other things that we need to, we need to leave. For the Jews, they had to repent of their Judaism. Even though it was based on, upon the Bible, to a degree, but, it, but without the God of the Bible, without recognizing who Christ was, without, without recognizing the one, the one whom the law and the prophets was speaking of when he came in their presence, they didn't see him. So what's the word of God? Unless we believe on the word of God, unless we believe on Jesus personally. And so this is something that each person must do themselves. And so there's praise for a personal God David uh, has here. There's praise for a powerful God. In God and his relationship with him, David finds all the strength that he needs to make it through life. There's eight metaphors that are given for us here that David uses to describe God and to describe God's power in our lives. Not just his life, but in our lives. Let's think about them briefly. God is our stability. David describes God as a rock. And so this word refers to a rocky mountain. David reminds us that when it appears that the world is spinning out of control, how many have read the news lately? It's, 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 it appears that the world is spinning out of control. But remember, God told us all these things would happen. And even in our own life, he says, in this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so David reminds us that when it appears that the world is spinning out of control, the believer can stand above it all when he stands on the Lord, when he stands on the Lord and on the truth of his word. 
God allows his people to live above the trials and the turmoil that engulf the world all around us. He doesn't necessarily remove us from it, but he, he'll, go through, uh, he'll go through it with us. And so our relationship with the Lord gives us a different perspective on these trials of life. When we stand in him, we see these trials through, through his eyes and even through the difficulties and even when we're in the midst of those difficulties and struggles, we can see that God may be using those things to teach us something. And they can still be used to cause to our hearts to bow in worship. Job, remember in his trial, how, how did Job understand and recognize? Job was looking to the one. Job was looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said at the end of Job, he said, yet, you know, though, though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. He knew the Messiah was going to rule and reign on the earth one day and that he, in his flesh, would rule and reign with the Messiah one day. And Job, at the end of his trial, said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Even those closest to him did not recognize what he saw. And so, you know, you can't be counting on the faith of your mother or your brother or your sister or others. It needs to be personal. For Job, it was personal. His wife didn't even uh, curse God and die. She didn't understand what he was seeing as he was looking through those eyes of faith. I mean, she, uh, she was probably in great pain seeing all that he was going through. But, Dave, but um, Job saw something different. Job was able to see the Lord even through all those difficulties. So God is our stability. God is our safety. David says that God is like a fortress. This is probably reference to the mountains to which he fled when he was running from Saul, all those different places he could hide there. And David reminds us that the Lord is a place of safety to which the believer can flee in times of trouble. Psalm 57, verse 1. The Bible says, In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge. And so it's not just the location. It's not just the craggy rocks or whatever, but you can be in the craggy rocks and still be in total fear. You can be in the greatest fortress in, the, in a, in a, in a, in a you know, nuclear-proof um, bomb shelter, without, and you can still be in fear. Why uh, you know, are those in the end of the book of Revelation, why are they calling on the mountains and the hills to fall on them and to spare them from the wrath of the Lamb? It's because they don't know him. They've not repented and trusted him. But when we know him, we can be in the middle of the storm. We can be in, we can be in, in Ravensburg, Germany, like Corey Tenbaum, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the pit. And, you know, her faith struggled many times. It was Betsy that had to remind her that God is with us in these times. God will help us through. And so sometimes we lose sight. Sometimes our brother or sister or mother, somebody else, some other believer has to remind us, get, our eyes, get your eyes back on the word. Don't look at the problem. Look at the God of the problem. He will bring us through. And he's allowing us to be in this place right now so that we can be a blessing to others. Maybe that difficulty, that struggle that we're going through, then we can comfort others with the comfort wherewith we ourselves have been comforted. It's difficult when you're in the middle of it. And Corey often spoke about how her sister was so annoying at times and whatnot, and she didn't have that faith at that time. <clears throat> but, you know... Sometimes others are not at the same place we are. We need to help them. We need to lift them up and say, listen, I understand what it's like to doubt. I understand what it's like to not believe and to not trust, but I'm gonna, I want to be a help to you. I want to be a help to you, and God will help you, and we can pray for them and pray for one another. <clears throat> God is our, our safety. God is our Savior. So David refers to this time of trouble and this trial, this time of difficulty. But David reminds us that the Lord is a, is a place of safety. The Lord himself is the one who the believer can flee to in times of trouble. Psalm 57, verse 1, In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge. In the shadow of thy wings will I make thy refuge. The Bible describes Satan, of course, as something completely different. He's described as a roaring lion. 
seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. But the Christian has a place of safe refuge in the day of the attack. God is our fortress. The lion, the lion can make all the noise he wants, but if we're in the shadow of the Almighty, then that's not ultimately going to get through to us. God is our fortress, our place of perfect peace and safety. God is our Savior. David refers to the Lord as his deliverer. This word refers to one who saves, one who rescues, one who delivers, of course, from danger. And so not only did the Lord save us when we, re when we received him personally by faith, but he goes on to sanctify us, the Bible says, day by day. Justification is in a moment, right? Justification is, we may not remember the day, but we should remember a season where maybe our faith that was in our head actually touched our heart, where we really truly did believe on the Lord, not just intellectually, but in our heart. We may not remember the day, but we should know the season, but our sanctification is progressive. We're continuing to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. That will happen until the day we see Christ, because we will not be like him until we see him as he is. Hopefully, by God's grace, there's less of us as we're going down that journey, and there's more of him, but we need to continue to look to him. And so when this life is over, we know that the ultimate salvation of body, soul, and spirit is, of course, when we arrive home in heaven, 1 Peter 1, 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, that's not speaking that our salvation is somewhere in the future, as we talked about on, on Wednesday night. Th there is an aspect of that because the salvation of our body, you know, will not happen because we're, you know, we're in... Our corruption must put on incorruption. So the complete salvation of our body will not happen until we see Christ. The salvation of our soul and spirit is secure already. The Bible says we're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. As far as, you know, as much as we can't understand that entirely, we know that our life is hid with Christ and God, the Bible says. But flesh and blood shall never inherit the kingdom of God. So something needs to happen to this decrepit, sin-stained body that by God's grace I'm not continuing to, we're not continuing to walk in. We're walking in the spirit that will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, but yet this still needs to be eradicated, and it has not yet been eradicated, but it will happen when we see Jesus. And so God is our Savior. God is also our sovereign. David refers to him as God, this word El, El, like Elohim. It refers to God as the almighty God. This word pictures God as one who is over all things, one who is in control of all things. As children of God, we should rejoice in the knowledge that even when we cannot make sense of things in life, God is still on his throne. He changes not. So our mind may go this direction and that direction, but listen, we need to get rid of the stinking thinking and get back into the word of God. If you do not have your mind... Um, transformed by his word you may not even be in church next year you know because you can end up going so far down another path that you don't even know who God is anymore if you ever knew him at all we need him our sustenance you know if you only saw your wife once a year or one you know once a month or once every two months I know sometimes people work in there's long distance relationships but it doesn't work really well You've got to nurture the relationship. You need to have the relationship grow. You need to invest in each other. And that's what, that's what we have with God. It's not religion. It's a relationship. Religion just means discipline. Do I have a religion with my wife? Well, I have certain disciplines with my wife. My wife has certain disciplines in regards to me, in regards to what she does and doesn't do because she's married to me. And I have certain disciplines in my life because of her. But it's because of the relationship. It's not based upon just the discipline. Oh, I'm going to invoke this discipline. No, it's because a relationship came. The two became one. And we have loved one for another. And the feelings might not always be there, but we have to remember the decision that we made for one another. And that God brought us together. And that we have to invest in each other. And, ultimately, and of course, our relationship with God must be strong. And so this is, it's, it's, it's so cyclical because 
this is the picture that God uses, the picture of marriage that God uses in regards to his relationship with the church. Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them are the called according to his purpose. Remember Job said in Job 23, verse 10, we have the account, it says, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as, God, as gold. I shall come forth as gold. And so God, the, the, the path may be difficult this time, at times, but we know ultimately because of the relationship that was started, and we know the ending as well. And so God is our sovereign. God is our strength. This word refers to a cliff or an unmovable rock. When everything else in the world is being tossed and twisted, listen, God forever remains the same. Everything else is changing around us. But he is always stable. And you know, the, the things that, many of the things that people, you know, go and chase after instead of God, you know, the things that they say, there's something new coming down the pike. There's nothing new under the sun. It has maybe some new uh, a new veneer on it. It's been repackaged. But it's the same corruptible lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life repackaged some way. And it's always trying to draw us away from the God in whom we live, move, and should have our being. <clears throat> he is unmovable. Malachi 3.6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are on the rock. Psalm 40, verse 2, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He is unmovable. We're fickle. We're you know, here and there, but we, may not, we need to understand who, he, who he, he is, and then we need to understand who we are in him. We may not feel that way today. I don't feel like I've been a very good Christian today or this week. But if we have trusted him, we need to acknowledge what he says about us. That I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? So we need to know that. We need to know what God says. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Satan will try to tell you, you know, you haven't done this right, you haven't done that right, and whatever the case might be. And then we will remain we will remain insecure in our relationship with God. And we'll not be able to move forward by faith. How can we as, if I'm insecure about, okay, say I work for a company, and I'm insecure about the, um, I'm insecure. Victor, he's back. Praise the Lord, we'll talk after. Sorry, I had to, I had to say hello to him. I haven't seen him. How many years has it been? Almost 10 years. 10 years? I have a picture of you and my family right up front here. Oh, man, it's so nice to see you. It's good to see you too. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, you know, he is our rock. And when we know that, you know, things in life may change, and we may have got tossed to and fro. But if I work for a company, listen, I'm trying to sell something. If I don't believe, I mean, I know there are people who work for companies, sell things, even though they don't believe in the product. I understand that. But I could not do that. You know, how can you say something about something? How can you tell people about something if you don't even believe in it? And what I do is go to the person's house. Do you have one of these? Do you use one of these? Does this really make a difference in your life to the extent that you're telling me? And that's how it needs to be. How are we, gonna, how are we ever going to talk to and tell other people about the Lord unless we believe in him, unless we have trusted him, unless we're continuing to trust him, unless we know that our sins are forgiven and that we have a home in heaven? We have nothing to offer anyone. And so David tells us that God is all we need. We should rejoice in the truth that the God of heaven, listen, he desires to be the strength of our lives. That's, that's what he wants to be. He wants to be in that place. He doesn't want to be second in second place. He doesn't want us to be looking to other things in, you know, beside him. Listen, none of us know what we'll face in the coming days, but we can know that the God in heaven will give us the strength that we need to face life's trials and battles. 
and that he will help us all along the way. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Isaiah 43, verse 2. And when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Now you're going to be in that river. The water might be right up to your neck. Maybe the odd wave is, is coming over. But he says, I will be with you. I will be. It doesn't mean you're not going to be in the river. And it doesn't mean the waters are not going to try and, you know, and get you and trouble you. But he's told us that they will not overflow thee. Remember, that he is an ever-present God. Hebrews 13, 5. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. God is our strength and refuge. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, Psalm 46, 1. And so not only is God our stability, not only is God our safety, not, as, not only is God our savior and our sovereign, our strength, he is also our shield. David calls the Lord a buckler. This simply means a shield. Sometimes the Lord will allow trouble to come within our sphere of influence, into our lives. Yet as we look to him, he will give grace and strength. But there are times when the Lord will step between us and the trials, and he will shield us from that very storm that is coming. We may not see it at the time. We may not recognize it till later. Only in heaven sometimes will we fully comprehend the times when God in his providence has intervened in our lives and delivered us from something terrible that was headed our way. I look back now, I remember car accidents I was in and, and different things that happened before I was a believer and brushes with death, but at the time I didn't think anything of it. I just, well, well, whatever. But now I look back and I say, God help me. God protected me and watched over me. One time I went over a 300-foot cliff in the mountains of British Columbia in a, in a 66 Impala. And my Tante Fena, who was in, in Canada at that time, she had come from Emmon, she, was she said, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was praying for you. See, she knew something was wrong. God knows and God will help us. God will protect us in those times. He's our ultimate shield. He stood between us and the terrible wrath of God the Father. Jesus stood in between as the shield. His salvation is offered for all mankind, but it's only effectual to those who call upon his name. Because God did not create us as robots. He says, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But the individual must make a choice to turn toward God. Choose ye this day who you will serve. If the Lord be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. There's a choice. There's always been a choice, a decision that the individual must make toward God. 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But the whole world is not saved. Because Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Romans 10, 13, if you look at it in context, it is specifically referring to salvation. The need for each person to come to Jesus and be saved. Not just have an intellectual understanding, but to come to Jesus based upon what Jesus says about our sin and about salvation and about what he has done for us. And so God is our shield. God is also our security. Here the Lord is called a horn of salvation. The horn is a symbol of strength and conquest. When David calls uh, God the horn of salvation, he's saying that the Lord is the strength of salvation and that in his salvation we have absolute security first peter 1 verse 5 who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation and so he's never lost one god has never lost one that has come to him he's not going to start with you he didn't save you to lose you along the way but he saved you to take you to heaven that's what he told us first john Chapter 5, verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, behold, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. Right? I mean, Jesus wants us to be where he is. And he's not, he's not you know, just left us here you know, to aimlessly 
try and make it to heaven, but he has given us all that we stand in need of. He's given us his word. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us each other to encourage and exhort one another, the Bible says, and all the much more as we see the day approaching. When we leave the walls of this room, we're walking into the land of doubt and unbelief and liars and, and, uh, and the Bible says evildoers and seducers show wax worse and worse. The Bible says walk circumspectly, not as fools, redeeming the time for the days are evil. We live in an evil day. And you, your children, your grandchildren... The enemy's out to get them. And so we need to pray that God put a hedge about them. We need to do our best to put a hedge about them, about the truth of God's word and whatnot, but they, we need to implore them and, and, and point them to Christ and, and make a decision for Christ themselves. When I read about the horn of salvation, I think of the cornucopia, that horn the horn of plenty. This was a curved goat's horn that was filled overflowing with fruit and ears of grain and all these things that was kind of a symbol in the harvest time, a symbol of overflowing abundance, if you will. It's too bad that, that John's mom came in August. We should have waited till September, but because the Chilliwack corn would have been would have been ready then at that time. That's one of my favorite things. She could have come with a suitcase full of Chilliwack corn. That would have been a blessing. One of the, the harvest of the fall. Many times these are things that we enjoy. Things that are a blessing to us. Things that we enjoy and that give us sustenance. And so that we see this analogy in the word of God. That's what the sinner finds when he comes to the Lord. He finds so much, you know, so much more, so much, so much sweeter than the sweetest things that we may partake of here on earth. And there's some beautiful things that God has given us and that we can... Uh, we can enjoy together, but it's nothing compared to what God himself is to us. In Jesus, we receive so much more than we could ever have imagined. He's our security, but he's also our source. And this, again, of course, is what sanctification is all about. He's our supply. In the last metaphor, David says that the Lord is our high tower, and so this refers to great towers that were built in these ancient cities. You see them in the ancient cities of our world still today. And from these towers, soldiers could look over uh, their attackers. When my sister was here one year in August, they had the Open Monument Day here in the Netherlands. And we were living in Harlem at that time. And we, went, we were able to go in the Grote Kerk in Harlem and go up the uh, Toren and go in places that you don't normally ever go. And, and when you go up above... You know, if you go into the Chota Kerk in Harlem, you see that wood ceiling. It's so, so high, and it looks so beautiful. But there's, there's like uh, another ceiling above that, and there's a platform that goes, and you can walk on that all above that ceiling. And then we were able to go up a small little uh, stairway and go right into the tower of, uh, of that old church in Harlem. And so that, that church in Harlem, they, sure, they rang the bell on Sundays for people to come to church, but it was also used to look for enemies that were coming because they had, they had the best vantage point of anywhere, of course, to be able to see. And so this is how it was. Many of these towers were used for multiple purposes uh, back in that day. They were above the battle. They were a place of rest many times and, and, and refreshment because many of the other uh, towers that would be on the city gates and whatnot, they would be full and stockpiled with ammunition and extra food and water and all these other kinds of things. And so they were a place where the soldiers could run not only to restock an ammunition, but to get refreshment and a ready supply. You know, God is the same for his children. When the battle rages around us, listen, we need to run to him. He is our refuge. And others may be a help to us, but ultimately, the Bible says there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Nobody can replace him. Nobody can be... Nobody can give us what he does. It's a place of refreshment to be able to fight, continue to fight the battle, to be able to get back out there. And so we must remember that the battle is the Lord's. 1 Samuel chapter 17, 47. The Bible says, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. What an amazing truth to understand. 
It's no wonder that David praised the Lord. The fact is that we have the very same reasons to praise the Lord that David did. So let's praise him. Let's honor him. Let's resolve in our hearts. Even though in the, we're in the thick of a battle right now and we don't feel like praising the Lord, the Bible says we're to praise him at all times. We're to worship him and serve him in spirit and in truth. You know, David didn't praise God because he thought that God may have helped him. <clears throat> Looking back, for instance. Oh, maybe it was God that helped me in that. Maybe it was coincidence. Maybe the stars lined up and everything, you know, just fell into place. He praised God because he knew of what God had done for him. And he stood on the promises of what he knew that God was going to do for him in the future. You see? He believed the word, in other words. And so God is worthy of our delight. He's worthy of our dependence. And finally, he's worthy of our devotion. In verse 3 of Psalm chapter 18. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from mine enemies. In this verse, David makes a pledge to call on God, to trust him and him alone for, all, for the victories of life. The idea communicated here is that the psalmist is aware of the power of God, and he is pledging to walk in that awareness. It's not just, okay, having the awareness of knowing who God is and what he has done, but it's, it's, a, it's a pledge and a commitment now to walk his life in that awareness, if you know what I'm saying. Because of what God has done, I am now going to walk in the light of that truth, not by what I see alone through the physical eye, but what I see through the eye of faith. He pledges to walk by faith and not by sight, in other words. Hebrews 11:6 reminds us of this. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. There have been times when David was on the run. He thought he'd be captured. He thought he would be killed by Saul. But God had proven greater than his enemy at all these different turns. David knew that if God could do it yesterday, you see his faith was growing. It was built upon yesterday's victories. Then he could be counted on to do it tomorrow. Past victories build our faith in God for the future battles. And they will come. There's another one just around the corner, right? So what a great lesson for us. As children of God, we must learn that God is in all of these different things he can help us and he can protect us and he can watch over us he can provide for us he will refresh us he will ever be there for us so our duty then is to walk by faith and not by sight we need to remember the lord our god who he is that's the important part who he is what he has done how are we going to know who he is unless we look to who he is in accordance with his word All that he's done so that we honor him and that we praise him. And that, of course, can only be, will be reflected in, in our life, in our response to him. So we need to live like we believe that he is the God of the universe. We need to pledge to walk by faith, by his help, by his strength. Sometimes we can't do it. We don't want We can't do it ultimately anyway. But sometimes we don't even have a desire to do it. So we have to pray and ask God to change our desire. Change our heart. Change our... Give me a desire for the things of your word. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. This world is continually telling us that our soul should be lifted up in ourselves. That we should be, you know, we should have good self-esteem and we should be know who we are and we should be proud of who we are and proud of what, you know, of, you know, what we are and what the universe made us or what we made ourselves. That's what Satan would like to tell us time and time again. But God loves us. He created us. And our own desires may go against that, what God has for us, but we need a purpose in our hearts to say, God, help me to walk in what I know to be true in accordance with your word, not with my emotions tell me, 
not what my teacher tells me or what somebody else on the street tells me, somebody who doesn't even know you, but let me know who I am based upon what you have told me, the one who created me. And so in every trial, his grace is extended toward us because when we are weak, then he is strong. Sometimes in that weakness is the time when we will turn to him. And sadly, most of the other time, often, we're walking in our own strength. And so David reminds us that our God is a God who is worthy to be worshipped. He is worthy of being our delight. He is worthy of being our dependence, of our depending on him. He's worthy to be praised, exalted. He's worthy to be followed. As David says in verse 46 of this psalm, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. Father, we thank you for the great reminder that we have here, David reminding us who didn't always walk in accordance with the path that he should have, but, but when he remembered, when he thought about who you are, and, so, and he had to be reminded, we remember by Nathan the prophet there that one time. Lord, we need to be reminded time and time again of who you are and all that it is you've done and all that it is you've promised us. And then, Father, help us as we have the knowledge. It's, good, it's great to have the knowledge of who you are that we have from your word. We thank you for the Bible that we have in our hands today because of the great sacrifice of those that have gone before us. But, Lord, help us to believe it by faith. Help us to trust you by faith. First and foremost as our personal Savior. And then also, of course, as we look forward in our life, as we look ahead to what lies ahead in this world that's so full of uncertainty. Help us to trust you and to look to you and know that you are in control and you are the God who changes not. We thank you, Lord. We ask this all in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, as the pianist plays quietly, take a moment and speak with the Lord. I don't know what your need is today. If you're not certain of your salvation, God says, come unto me. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. The rest and the peace that passes all understanding can be ours if we'll come to Christ, if we'll trust him. We'll take him at his word. He says, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's a wonderful truth. It's a wonderful promise. But we must believe it, not just in our head, but in our heart. Any that are watching by way of live stream, you need, to, you need to know that you know that your sins are forgiven, that you have a home in heaven. Come to Christ even today. For those of us that know him, are we resting him? Are we trusting him? The, the trials of life will come. The struggles, sadly, are real. But God wants to be your help and your fortress, your strong tower. He wants to be there for you in your time of difficulty and help you through the battles that lie ahead. Speak with the Lord as he's spoken to your heart. Well, we're going to close the service with a hymn, hymn number 599. But don't rush off. Our fellowship will continue downstairs. There's some fresh baked goods down there, some coffee and tea. And um, if you have a particular need or a question, then see me after the service downstairs. I'll be down there in just a few minutes. If you have to leave and, and, and Brenda hasn't come out of the Sunday school yet, make sure you go and say hello to her. She'll be happy to see you and um, say hello to you. 
But let's stand together and turn our hymn books to hymn number 599. 599. you can see him, he's like this, like a long distance runner, but praise the Lord that he did follow the Lord and believe his baptism, and uh, Victor, do you want to tell us a little bit where you, what, what's going on in your life, where you've been? Uh, so, uh, I live in Scotland. You're still there? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm still in Scotland, okay. so I leave and walk there. Okay. So, so. You're still working in IT? Uh, yes. Okay. So, I, I work, I work in the, in, in, the, in the IT space. Uh, yeah. Well, you're just here for a visit? Yeah, I'm just here for the weekend. Well, thank you for coming and being a part of the service today. Thanks. Nice to see you again. If you want to get to know Victor, talk to him. We'll be downstairs. And Victor, make sure you go straight across the other side of the Sunday school room and say hello to Miss Brenda because uh, she'll be happy to see you in case she doesn't get downstairs. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for friendships. Lord, that maybe we don't see people for some time here, but Lord, we thank you for the love we can have one toward another. And we will see some of the love that sometimes we have the opportunity to see them again here, and that's a great blessing, but we know that we will see them ultimately together again in heaven, and we thank you for that wonderful glory that we have, especially for those of us that have loved ones that have passed away or loved ones that are in other parts.
parts of the world that we cannot see all the time. We thank you for the comfort that you give us and the hope that you give us of the resurrection and the life. Father, thank you for this service. We thank you for your word. Pray that you would bless your word to our hearts now. Lord, help us to continue to think about the truth of Scripture and what it is that we need to learn from your word today. And Father, we thank you for this time that we're able to have the snacks that have been provided. We thank you for the hands that have prepared, prepared it. We pray that you strengthen us through it. That you bless our time of fellowship together now. Be with us as we go our separate ways. Help us to remember, Lord, that when we leave this place, we're entering the mission field. Help us to be your ambassadors in this great ministry of reconciliation as you've told us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. The vocation Maybe some of the, many of the men in the church are IT. Many do other things. We're all involved in different areas of life to make a living. But Lord, our vocation is an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you can use us. And you can do through us what you, we are completely capable of doing ourselves to reach the hurting, the lost, those that are, those that are struggling today in our society where we have so much, but yet... And we're surrounded by so many people, but yet it seems people are still so lonely. Father, help us to love others and to be a help and encouragement to them. We thank you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.